Thank you very much. Good morning. Happy to see some faces uh, here. Uh, it's still very early, so... Uh, well, let's go. Um, my name is uh, Niels van Dijkhuizen. I also go by the nick of uh, Nebula. Um, I work with a, a C-cert in a large organization in the Netherlands. Um, well, I like to tinker with uh, electronics. I'm a demo senior as well. Um, in my spare time, I, I do some research. And I want to show one of my, uh, my projects. Um, the project originated from, uh, from some pen tests, um, um, where I got some obstacles, and that's why I thought of this, uh, this project. And um, I want to I wanna ask you uh, something. Um, how many of you have active protection on some USB attacks on your laptops? Please raise hands. Nobody? That's interesting. There are quite some attacks. Uh, the purpose of the presentation is to uh, raise some awareness. Again, we already know that there are some attacks uh, available. Um, of course, you're not the uh, average uh, person. Uh, you know something about security. But still, but still, uh, let's see what we can do. Oh, I forget to mention uh, the agenda for today. We start off with some attacks that you probably already have heard of. Um, What's wrong with them? The available protection mechanisms. Um, and then we'll talk about my implant and what it's tried to achieve. So short history. Um, the oldest reference I could find on USB uh, keyloggers was from 2005, the key host. If somebody knows an older reference, please uh, let me know. Um, then five years after that, um, 2010, we get uh, Fucked, which is a programmable hit USB keyboard dongle from, um, from Adrian, Adrian Crenshaw, also known as Iron Geek. Um, Hack5 also created uh, the rubber ducky back in the, around the same time. Um, they are both based on uh, TNC, TNC2 microcontroller. And in 2011, uh, Adrian enhanced it a bit by um, um, combining it with a keylogger, and my presentation is also um, uh, combining the two things, so sniffing and injecting keystrokes. But it has some other accents. Um, in 2014, um, BetUSB was presented by uh, Carsten Noll, uh, SR Labs from, in Germany, um, which manipulated, which uh, explained manipulation of firmware uh, to, to get new uh, uh, functionality out of uh, ordinary um, um, devices. Uh, and this was also shown by uh, uh, Adam, Co Adam Col Coudrin, Coudril and Brandon Wilson uh, with the Psy Psycon, uh, Psycon uh, implementation. Um, same year, uh, Semi Chemcar showed his USB drive by, which just added uh, mouse uh, support, mouse emulation on top of the uh, keystroke injections. In 2016, uh, we've seen um, um, a paper from uh, David about, uh, well, he, he calls it uh, bad USB 2. This is what essentially what he does is to take two fa face dancer uh, boards with a mediating machine to uh, to get a man-in-the-middle attack on uh, low-speed uh, USB devices. And this year we've seen uh, the Bash Bunny, which is essentially a rubber ducky on steroids with, uh, with uh, well, let, let's say a programmable bad USB, and the Cactus um, uh, Wi-Fi hit uh, injector, which is a, uh, a keystroke injector with Wi-Fi support. So what's wrong with them? Well, they are kind of in your face. If a user sees the computer doing weird things, um, well, uh, they might throw out uh, the device, they might shut the machine, they might go to somebody with uh, IT security knowledge. Um, so it's not very stealthy. So in order to, to make this kind of attack work, you either require uh, an unlocked and unattended machine, you have really, 
to do some good social engineering uh, with quite some distraction to get the opportunity to, uh, uh, to, to get a payload on the machine. Um, and many of the payloads we've seen for, for the injectors are uh, depending on payload uh, from a network, mostly internet. That's not always accessible. Uh, I mean, enterprises can have something like a Citrix farm with internet connection and not the endpoints itself. Um, and there are protections available. We can do class filtering, etc. So that's what we're going to look at now. Um, we've seen Robert Fisk's um, USG and Dominic Spill's uh, USB proxy. Both are external devices that you put in between your device and your host. And the first one uh, allows to act as a, a, a bit of a firewall, USB firewall. But it has it's okay conceptually, so it um, doesn't allow re-enumeration of uh, um, uh, devices. So if I have a mass storage device and at some point it reconfigures itself as a, a keyboard, it will detect and will block this behavior and it will just shut the port. Um, and it does basic uh, some, some basic class filtering. Um, unfortunately, it's very slow. It's not even, I mean, it's... USB 1 speeds, but it's slow. It's too slow for practical use. You cannot transfer big files over it, for example. Um, Dominic Spill is still work in progress, uh, the USB proxy. Um, uh, at the moment, blocking, uh, write blocking uh, to my storage devices to uh, stop exfiltration, data exfiltration. Then we have the, the other, uh, the middle uh, group, um, which does class filtering. Uh, essentially, USB Guard is a, a pretty good example. It's a it's a Linux um, implementation done by uh, Daniel Kopecek from Red Hat. Um, it's very fine grained. You can you can even uh, fingerprint the device um, because it hashes the uh, the table descriptors and the report descriptors. So if you have a device with a different serial number, it will notice. It will not allow that particular device. So you can really do good black and white listing on USB devices. Uh, good Dog, Beam Gun, both uh, Windows tools, they uh, accept only certain types of devices. Um, and then there's G-Data's USB keyboard, uh, key, uh, keyboard guard, which just gives a pop-up when you enter, when you plug a, a new uh, uh, keyboard in your machine. Is this a real keyboard, yes or no? Then you have to answer as a human. And then there's Duck Hunt from uh, Pedro M. Sosa. This will this is a Windows tool as well. It will monitor for superhuman typing. As soon as it sees superhuman typing, it will just um, get the focus away from the object and uh, it will block the, the attack. And finally, uh, GR Security has a nice patch that um, allows only devices connected at boot time to be connected. Everything plugged in afterwards will just not be accepted. So there are some protection options available. So my implant tries to do things differently. Um, I want to have a hit attack that works with locked machines and bypasses known protections. Uh, furthermore, I'd like, to be, like it to be affordable, small, and covert. Well, how am I going to do that? Well, the implant should be in line with the, uh, the keyboard and the host. Uh, this way, I don't have to deal with the re-enumeration. Um, I can do credential sniffing. I can uh, see uh, monitor activity of the user. And this allows, um, um, I mean, the second one is uh, the implant should have notion of real time. And this allows uh, for uh, programming of uh, the attack time frame. Uh, which is, which can be convenient. And to spice it up a bit, um, it would be nice to have some uh, means of uh, remote control. And um, let's do that over the air on, in, in local uh, communication so that we can do remote sniffing and controlling. Will not be this, this small, <laughs> no, not the cotton mount size. So, this is what the hardware um, diagram would look like. Um, 
We start off with a, a USB host uh, controller. Uh, I based mine on, uh, on the Maxim chip um, that connects the keyboard with the microcontroller. The microcontroller is a TNC2 because it's nice and tiny and it's easy programmable. That connects to a, um, a Maxim uh, real-time clock, a high precision uh, real-time clock, RTC. And we connect uh, a 433 megahertz uh, UART to the, uh, to the controller. And we need some EEPROM uh, for non-volatile non uh, uh, memory storage to, to, uh, to have a configuration. This is what my proof of concept looks in, uh, uh, yeah, for real. Um, could have been smaller, of course, um, but it's proof of concept, right? So um, I can ditch the, the, the little EEPROM, the one you see over here. Let's see, uh, the one over here. Because essentially um, the TNCLs already has uh, EEPROM uh, on board and I don't need the extra space. So um, if I make my own PCB, I can just stack, uh, stack the TNC and stack st stuff on top of each other and then we'll have a, a smaller form factor. And this is a photo of it with a lid closed. Some nice uh, LED, LED uh, indicators to see it, see it functioning. So let's talk about bypassing some of the protection mechanisms. Um, so, um, USB enumeration um, essentially is the process where um, you, you check the, uh, the device, you ask for a blob called a descriptor to see what, what the device actually is. It describes itself to you so that the host knows, okay, this is a mass storage device from a certain brand. Um, so what we have to do, we have to clone those descriptors in order to bypass uh, the, the, the class filtering or the black-white black, uh, black white listing uh, that we saw uh, with the USB guard, for example. So that's exactly what I did. It was a bit of a hassle um, because um, um, at some point I had to figure out um, um, the device that TNC uh, presented itself as a USB 2 device, but a keyboard is a low-speed device, as you might know. So. Um, but it's, it's really doable, it's, it's quite easy once you know how to do it. And then we have to, tech to, to bypass the human, uh, human uh, of, I mean, superhuman typing speeds. Well, that's quite easy, right? We just have to uh, throw in some tens of milliseconds um, uh, in order to, to look like a human. Um, so I created my own uh, Arduino device class to uh, to get both done, to, to do the device cloning and um, um, the normal typing. Well, that's the speed a normal key injector works with, so it's quite fast. And if we use the, um, the class I, I created, we just get slow speeds, that's all. Tom -ti -dum. So that way we can bypass Duck Hunt, for example. Then we have to take the power consumption into account as well, because um, we cannot um, uh, use too much uh, current, of course. So we we have to draw all the current from the from the from the host. Sorry. Not that I'm not that I am aware of. Uh, I, I think that that would be interesting indeed, that then you can profile. The, the, the question was, uh, can you monitor that from the OS uh, operating system? And that would be a, a good uh, approach, I think, to, to, to see whether there's something in between and, and have a profile for every device. As you can see, the, the, the differences aren't that big, uh, except for the uh, uh, peak power uh, uh, current, uh, current uh, consumption. Uh, when the key, the key interceptor is in between, it's 40 milliamps more at max. So when it's fully, uh, trans I mean, the, the transmission uh, costs some uh, costs some energy. So 
but it's still within the, the boundaries that the descriptor is uh, describing to the host. Um, the keyboard I cloned um, was allowed to use 100 milliamps, and I just got there, so it, it's, it's okay. I think I'm, I'm still within the specs. So the bill of material, the cost, well, it's really affordable. This is just common off the shelf stuff. Um, if I would make my own PCB and, and, and solder on my own chips and, and bulk order the chips, I, I can, can get it the price lower, of course. I think uh, $35 or 30 euros is still uh, acceptable. So here we have it. It's a small, cheap, uh, or affordable device, um, which is quite hard to detect from the, from the host side. Um, it can bypass uh, protection mechanisms because we clone the descriptors, we type like a human, and no emulation is needed because, well, it's part of the keyboard. Um, whoops. And uh, we can think of different use cases for the, the Kint Acceptor. Uh, we can control over the air. Uh, we can uh, auto log in with captured credentials. We can inject keystrokes after a chosen time frame. Block the user's input, so essentially used as an RF uh, kill switch. Insert your scenario here. Um, my scenario is the following. I made a companion for Kinterceptor. Uh, I built it into a, uh, a power block. Um, the power cord that you see there is not a regular power cord, it's a UTP cable. And inside is a uh, little power supply with um, the Nano Pi Neo, uh, a small uh, yeah, Raspberry-like uh, device, which has a, um, a 4G uh, a dongle connected with, on it and a 433 uh, megahertz transceiver. And this is how it fits in. We have um, a carry grade netting, of course, because most operators, mobile operators, will do uh, carry grade netting. Therefore, listening on a ser uh, listening services will not work. Uh, IPs will often change, so that's why we need a VPN. So just put a VPN server on the internet, connect from the from the companion to the to the VPN server. And you can do the same with, a, with an attacking laptop or a mobile phone. And then that way we can connect to it over the world. And the advantage of this is um, it's less detectable than Wi-Fi. Um, you will easily find uh, rogue uh, Wi-Fi uh, access points. It's a bit harder with uh, 4G. And then the interceptor and uh, the companion are talking to each other uh, locally over 433 megahertz. So, demo time. Let's see. Um, yeah. So we have a regular office with a computer and we start to plug in the, um, the uh, companion because it takes a while to, uh, to set up a connection to start the VPN. In the meanwhile, we get the Kinterceptor. And if you do pen tests or red teaming or something like that, I would advise to, to pick a machine that's on the desk because it's easy, like, easy accept, easier to accept, access. This way it takes a bit, bit of time, sorry. Okay. So, at some point you will see the companion uh, LED blink. Um, that's an indicator that it's waiting for a configuration to, to receive from the... Uh, did I say companion? The interceptor is blinking to receive a configuration file from the companion. So I start the VPN on uh, my mobile phone. And then I can uh, access the, uh, the web interface via web app. And at this point you will see ETH0 is not yet defined. It doesn't have uh, an IP address, so I connect 
connected to the, the local network. We get an IP address and we, then we are able to uh, either uh, put it in demo mode or timed mode and set the start and the stop time when it, when it can be active. And then we send over the IP address and both the, 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 the period in which it can be active. Now the LED is stopped blinking because it received the, uh, the configuration which is stored in the EEPROM. So if I put, um, disconnect the, the interceptor and reconnect it, it will still have the configuration. So we put away the stuff so it's not in the inside. Unfortunately the, the companion didn't fit between the desk, so, but you get a point. So somewhere else, different location, I have a teetering, uh, start teetering, and I set up a VPN. And we just SSH into the companion, start a listener at the left, start a keystroke uh, uh, monitor or sno snooper at the, at the right to see what the, the victim is, uh, is doing. So we see the user being active on this machine and we see the, the keystroke sniffer on the right side. So everything is transferred over the 433 megahertz uh, connection. So at some point the machine gets locked, the user has to go to the toilet for example, returns, enters his, his password and the password is captured by the interceptor. In the evening, if the person leaves the machine on, we get into the active uh, time frame, 20 minutes of inactivity, the interceptor just logs in to the machine and starts to type PowerShell commands to retrieve the payload from the from the interceptor uh, companion from the companion. And this way we get a shell to the companion. And since we already have a connection to the companion, I can take over the machine. Start doing lateral movement and that kind of stuff. There we go. I've got the local IP address and the listener, and we can see top secret was the, the password typed by the user, and the machine is popped. So we're ready to go. So is this realistic? I think so. Uh, it, it took some while to, 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 to make it and test it. And, but I think if I can do this, um, uh, well, um, not everyone, but I think a lot of people, lot, I mean, everybody could do it. Um, so there's some future work. Um, I, I might see, um, I might try to fit it in real hardware. Um, have automated description, uh, uh, automatic descriptor cloning. At this point, I just cloned it. Um, was some manual labor. Um, and finally, encrypt over the air communication because this was just uh, decoding. The downsides um, of this approach is it needs good mobile coverage. I also have a companion which uses Wi Fi, uh, but, well, still need need to take that into account. Uh, you need some time to deploy, more time to deploy compared to a, a standard uh, keystroke injector. Um, yeah, and, and, and of course the, the user has to leave the machine on uh, within the time frame, the tech time frame. So 
Um, I think that's my presentation. In the, I hope the industry will come with, with some solutions because we, we really cannot trust our devices, right? So not the USB device at least. That's my presentation. Okay, questions without bribing with Mate. Any questions? Right. Uh, how did you manage to get the uh, 433, uh, 433 megahertz uh, connection reliable? Because uh, there tend to be a lot of crossfire on those things, key fobs, weather stations, stuff like that. And uh, if they insert into the uh, computer, that might be uh, a bit weird. Okay, well, uh, I had very good coverage with uh, 433 megahertz, much better than uh, the 2.4 uh, gigahertz uh, Wi-Fi. So... Um, and if you have a good line of sight, you can configure it this way um, that you can get over, uh, I think, a kilo kilometer of, uh, com um, yeah. I didn't put it, I configured it this way that, that um, it, um, the companion and the, and the interceptor would be in the vicinity. But mostly if you, if you have an office building, that's doable. And the communication was uh, pretty stable. So um, if you want to know, it was the uh, HC12 module, Chinese Chinese thingy. And what did you do encoding-wise? So, Why did I do it? Encoding-wise. So how, how did you encode the, the, the letters and so on? Is it just so, a serial connection? Yeah, so uh, start the character, the uh, ASCII value, of the, I mean the scan code value, I guess, and, and a code to verify that that was a key press. Quite simple. Okay, so first of all, this is a fantastic project. Uh, to answer uh, the previous question, people scan frequencies, uh, and uh, the, the 2.4 is something people will look for, not so much the 433, exactly because of all the, the noise you said. What I could do, uh, suggest, though, is that you don't keep the link uh, active at all times. If you can do burst transmissions, then that is the best solution. Obviously, I think, so we mentioned the uh, power consumption, so that could be a, an interesting uh, gauge, and also, um, so the installation is complicated. If you make it a lot smaller, then that would be great. But then, not sure there's much to do with it, but a, dev a USB device to disconnect and reconnect would always be one of the signs, right? Because you have to put it in the middle. Connect, reconnect, yeah, but, but so if, if an attacker just turns off the machine, yeah. put it in between. Well, you if, you put it, if you put it when the machine is turned off, then no one can ever detect that. But if you install it on a running machine... Yeah, true, true. But since it really looks like the same device, so okay, true. And there, there are some some other things you could do. Of course, you could you could, um, for example, limit the time that the machine is allowed to stay on after lo after user has locked the machine. Right? I mean, that's that's another thing you could do. Yeah, so that's OPSEC. But yeah, you could detect plugging unplugging. But in in real life, we sometimes unplug our keyboards. Right? So I know. yeah. Thanks. So, um, what is it that we, can, we that we can do against this? Is this completely undetectable? Is there nothing that we can do to defend against this? Not much. I, I would say it, it would be very well. What you could do, of course, is have a captcha, for example, uh, at the login screen or something like that, or two-factor authentication. It's a bit of a hassle, I know. Every time you lock your machine, you have to go through this process of typing extra stuff or clicking on something. But I think it would be it would be good a good design for for an operating system to to include such options. Like the Bluetooth keyboard pairing. Yeah, exactly. Like Bluetooth keyboard pairing, as uh, the man in the fro say, or fro, <laughs> fro, whatever. Any more questions, comments? No more questions. Oh, Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Hans.